Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Out of the Woods, Enriching Your Maple Business. This is a free webinar for maple syrup producers and enthusiasts alike. Uh, thank you for taking your time out while we know many of you are gearing up for or possibly have already started your maple season, um, as is the case for some of our West Virginia producers. Uh, this program is made possible through an ACER grant awarded to Future Generations University, The Ohio State University, and Penn State University. Tonight we have guest speakers Fred Ahrens and Cindy Martell talking about record keeping in the sugar bush and on the business side of things. So without further ado, I'll let Cindy take it away. Good evening. I hope everyone's doing well out there. So glad to see so many of you online and uh... We have a we have a interesting topic this evening, one that usually causes a lot of groaning in the world. Um, I want you all to look at the, this picture here, and say, you know, um, this is kind of kind of me, um, and I think that all of us can relate to some of the pictures I'm about to show you. Um, I'm going to do a quick overview before we get into Fred. Um, Fred's conversation this evening. Um, I love that Fred is a producer. I love that he's thought through all this. He's obviously resolved that internal battle between the words record keeping and paperwork. And so what we wanna to do tonight is look at the fact that most people think about record keeping as an exercise in paperwork and documentation and making sure that I have all of my eyes dotted when the inspector or someone else comes in or I'm getting ready to go sell my product. What we want you to think about tonight is, is that that paperwork can also serve as a record keeping source that allows you to do decision making. And when we talk about decision making in agriculture enterprises, which maple production is one, we know that decision making um, varies based on why you're doing maple syrup. Some of you out there may only be making five to 10 gallons a year and you're giving it away as friends, family. It's a hobby, it's something you enjoy. Others of you, it's your first revenue stream for the year and you have lots of other things that you're doing in the agricultural world and this is part of it. Some of you, this, you may be making a living out of it. So we look at how do we keep these records? And um, so I'm gonna tell you that some of these pictures um, were actually, I took out at the ranch this afternoon. So my world is ingrained in these pictures um, and I'm not terribly um, uh, happy about that, but we've added some enterprises. And so we're in this process of trying to get um, a better system together. So uh, we have the purse as the uh, filing system for receipts and all things Maple Enterprise. We have the infamous big box store bag where you throw them all in and at the end of the month, you go ahead and bring them to your account. We have the infamous, oh, go get that licensing or that production record for the day in the visor of the truck. And then we have the infamous stacks, next slide. There we go. We have those that are trying to integrate into some kind of a software system like QuickBooks or Quicken. Um, this is kind of where I'm at. And uh, there's inherent issues while you're trying to do that. Um, our family had a specialty food business in Vermont and West Virginia for several years. And my dad used to use these books when he was a barber and uh, that transferred and then they would go to Florida for the winter and my job was to categorize it all to bring it to the accountants so that they wouldn't charge us by the hour to re-enter it. Um, some of you have the frustration of you have these great computer programs and, and you've got it all on your computer, but you know, we're working in the agriculture field. You know, what are the odds that we're gonna break a screen or we're gonna have a crash or we don't have connectivity? Lots of issues there. Next slide. Um, then there's the infamous, I have a filing cabinet and it looks good, but this is really what it looks like on the inside. So let's face it, we've all been there. So this is all kind of a work in progress. And I show you all these pictures, not to discourage you, but to encourage you to think about the fact that none of these are wrong. None of these are right, but what's your next step 
as you try and streamline this and make it so that the information that you gather and collect is going to be useful for you as you go back and look at what it is you're trying to do in your maple business. Next slide. So originally, Karen will tell you I had that I was not judging <laughs> with those previous pictures. So what we want to do is we want to think about our maple enterprise as a whole, what we call a whole farm concept. And what we're looking at is we're saying that there are five areas of risk, five areas in your maple business, whether you're doing it for a hobby or if you're doing it as a, as a sole means of income, there's areas you've got to look at that can create risk that you really have to manage. And they're all congruent to that operation. And when we think about that and we look at each of those five risk areas, we realize record keeping has impact on each of them. For example, your human risk, those employees, if I don't know where to put, if I don't know where to put those receipts or I don't know how to claim my travel or my get reimbursed for my expenditures as an employee, then record keeping really becomes a way to help minimize that issue and that problem so that you don't lose a good person. Um, you know, record keeping in terms of paying people, um, advising them that it's important to plan for self-employment taxes. Obviously your legal risk in terms of how do I make sure I can track and, and, and I have a food product and how do I adhere to what I have to do there. Production, that, you know, that's the core of your infrastructure. And that's what Fred is really going to talk about how those records are important for making production decisions. But I would also advocate and invite you to consider tonight, but that those records are also impactful in all areas of your operation. And that's why we look at why we keep records. So think about it as record keeping for decisions rather than paperwork and an exercise and having to write it down. Next slide. want you to also remember that profit is not a four letter word. I know that Keith Easley is on tonight and him and I have a shared background in the whitewater industry. And when I was a whitewater guide, it was all about what is the latest, greatest technical, you know, Paco pad slash self bailing raft. And it was more about, you know, I wanted the latest toy. So you have to think about, do I need that RO? Am I at that? point in my operation where our RO is worth it? And the answer may be, heck yeah, I want to buy that RO because I'm doing this for fun. And if that's the goal of your business, then that's the right decision. But you may want to go ahead and look at the records that you have, whether or not you can justify that because you want to ultimately have profitability as an as a important item at the end of the day if it's beyond a hobby. And you can't improve what you don't measure. So if you don't have it written down, A, it didn't happen, and B, you don't have any baseline to make your decisions. Next slide. Um, there's lots of tools out there and there's no right answer. There's no wrong answer. What I have found in this industry is the best answer is for you all and the fact that you are very open and you all talk to each other. So um, I put this out here. This is, uh, this is, um, this is, uh, a notebook that you can purchase and it's good for all weather. Um, so consider your environment that we're asking you to, to record this information. You know, evaporators are not great places to try and keep pre paper records. Um, you know, out at tra tra trapping, tapping trees rather is not a great place. Um, next slide. The other thing I'm going to warn you about is, is, is the movement towards electronic recording, and that's all great. And there are a lot of apps out there. Um, I'm not even, this is just something I pulled off. I'm not endorsing or, or even know about these particular things. Um, but electronic capturing of data is great. Just make sure you have a backup. And you also want to make sure that you can access the information. Taking a picture of a critical control point um, say you have, you know, your hydrometer reading, writing it on the back of an envelope and taking a picture of it is great. But if you don't have a date, then, you know, you can't, you're kind of sunk in the woods um, at the, at the get-go. So those are just a couple of thoughts that I had as we get going. I'm really excited about this uh, Fred's presentation. And the reason why is because 
it's very practical. He's out there, he's doing it, it makes sense. And I encourage you at the end to please ask questions. And, and you know, we have the ability with this program to create a dialogue and um, help people um, go one step forward. And, and remember that you may not be able to do it all in one, in one season. And the latest greatest doesn't mean that the dome notebook still won't work. So with that, Karen, well, let's go. All right, thank you, Cindy. And um, we're on to Fred Ahrens. Hello, I'm Fred Ahrens, uh, president of uh, Richard's Maple Products. Been making syrup for about 30 years. Um, I have real world experience, I guess, uh, by no means an expert. Um, but um, went to a lot of seminars and, and uh, educational programs and, and uh, taking the best of all situations and try to compile and, and put together uh, the best scenarios in, in for what we do and, and, and try to help others with what they do to, to make it the best practical and economical way to, uh, to make syrup and, and, and have longevity. Next. I've had as many as uh, a dozen taps up to 3,500 and uh, everything in between. Sold equipment for a couple different dealerships and uh, been involved with many associations all the way up through IMSI uh, as a way to help others and, and uh, help educate. Next. <clears throat> so back in the old days, uh, people started making syrup. It was a popular thing, but uh, Usually it was to get the animals uh, conditioned for, for plowing in that. Nowadays it's a little bit different, but uh, it helps you get rid of the, the winter blahs and, and uh, help move on into and in, look for the excitement in the spring. So whether you're doing this as a hobby or, or full-time, you, you still need to record and at least be aware of, of what you have going on and what your financial status is and what, and what your inputs can be without getting buried and, and uh, overwhelmed. You, you definitely want to have that in perspective so that you don't get burnt out, worn out and irritated and not, not want to, to produce or, or have this as a, as a positive adventure. So whether it's whether it's a hobby or self-supporting, make sure you understand where you want to go with it. Stay focused. Uh, do your homework. Visit your neighboring uh, sugar bushes and and interstate. When if you're going to travel somewhere, visit other operations and see what they do and see what they've done wrong and and uh, take what they have done wrong and and make it positive for you that that, that you don't end up in the same situation and, and make it costly this uh, by ruining equipment or tubing or setting up things in the wrong situation can be very costly and um, this equipment's way too expensive to not to, to not be paying attention to that as Cindy had said uh, Make sure you uh, write down your plans and goals. Um, record everything you can so that way it's it's in your in your notes. Uh, the the SAP app is great. Make sure you print off anything you can because as technology changes and and we've seen other maple sites disappear, so will your information. Uh, make sure it's it's something that you can have tangible and. Um, 
have access to so you can compare notes. It's hard to remember from year to year, especially years down the road, what the situations were and uh, especially temperatures and, and time of tapping that you don't want to be too early to where your, your holes dry out, where everybody else is still making syrup and making a ton of syrup and, and a lot more money. You don't want to, you don't want to fall behind in that situation. Again, you don't want to buy your equipment uh, more than once unless you're going to upgrade. Uh, if it's in the near future, consider an extra upgrade more than what you need at the time, but, but not get too far ahead. There's a lot of people that like to make their own stuff, which is great. Um, but if you're buying some of that stuff that's made, pay attention to what it is, make sure that it's actually usable and um, that they're not getting rid of it for a good reason and, and you end up in a bad situation. Sugar makers love to talk maple and um, most of them anymore will give you lots of advice, good and bad, um, sort it out for yourself. Some, some situations even uh, things that weren't good for others work better for for some so you have to you have to figure that out and make sure you have many uh, many suggestions and, and many options uh, before you move forward and listen with a cautious ear because there's a lot of bad information out there and there's some that have only made syrup for a few years or a few situations and they really don't know but uh, to be, be careful of that. There's, especially with the internet nowadays, there's a lot of experts out there that might not necessarily have the intent of giving bad information, but it, it does happen and, and you fall victim to that situation. Set aside a realistic amount of hours that you can collect and, and boil and process so that you're making a good product. You wanna have yourself so so strapped down that you, again, don't wanna make syrup or, or you become so frustrated that you just throw it all to the back of the shed and after spending all that money and, and forget about it. Make sure you have plenty of help. Um, even, even uh, school kids in the afternoons, even a couple hours a day, if you have tubing systems, have them help you. Um, the little bit of money spent is, is going to be beneficial down the road that you have tight systems and have maximum amount of production as possible to, to uh, pay back your investment. So in your woods, 95% uh, is a general term, but it is majority of your money is made in the woods. This is by proper woodland management, setting up your equipment properly and doing it right the first time. Your sugar woods will increase in the uh, sugar content by thinning your woods. You don't want to be too aggressive on it. But at the same time, if you're if you're too thick, you ha you have to you have to thin out in order to be more productive. And, and there's a limit as to how many trees will make you successful. Putting in your, your tubing the first time correctly, making sure everything is downhill, good and tight, makes all the difference in the world as, as far as uh, getting your production and, and keeping that up with production. Nowadays, 
in Ohio, especially, we have several producers that can do a gallon of syrup per tap per year, no matter what. Uh, but they spend a lot of time in the woods. They're not cutting corners. They're, they're spending hours and hours out there making sure it's right. And for them, it makes it worth it with the large tap count. It, it uh, greatly increases your bottom line. So when you go to tree call, you want to have a forester involved and you want to check around, talk to other producers, other people that have their timber cut. There are quite a few places out there that don't do a good job and there's a lot of them that do a great job. You want to make sure that somebody, especially in maple, knows what they're doing with maple and, and calling the proper trees and that you have the least amount of damage as possible when those trees are coming down as, as well as dragging out. You don't want them ruining your equipment that you already have out there. You don't want them running over your main lines and, um, and, and ruining what you've, what you've tried to achieve and what you've set up ahead of time. Your payback will be two to five years. Usually it's a little bit sooner especially if they did a better job, you have less crown damage when the trees are coming down. That'd be a bigger advantage for you down the road and for regrowth. For your bucket and bag collection, you obviously wanna keep your paths to a minimum to reduce the root kill and damage and, and runoff at that point when you once you create the ruts, you want to limit your your loss of topsoil and uh, nutrients. Again, you want to hire somebody that can help you so that they can help you with leaks and minor things while you work on the major things and and get your sap collected. And, and get it back to the sugar house to boil down as fast as possible to make the, the best product you can, you can make. So a lot of this is uh, repetitive, but uh, keep keep writing down your time involved. Your your time is worth something. You have value in life, and you need to record that and and uh, be a value of yourself, and and make sure you're not wasting time. And and your your end product reflects the amount of time that you put in, so that you have a re reward at some point. Record the trees that are called the value of the logs or the firewood that you sold or, or using for other uses, the equipment that's put in to that woods, every little bit of it all adds up. And then when you're done tree, calling your trees, you want to more than visually remember what your crown growth and, and your girths are. You wanna see what that value did to your woods and how fast things are growing compared to where they were and, and see how your crown growth is growing on top and, and whether their branches are touching other trees or if there's large amounts of space between to, to see whether you were a little too aggressive or, or not. Now with those trees coming down, there's obviously gonna be more invasive species uh, bugs and shrubs, multiflora rose is gonna come back. You wanna stay on top of that to, to eliminate the, the, the negative uh, invasive species and, and that that, have, that are gonna grow back. The, the grapevines are gonna grow a lot and you wanna check your undergrowth, make sure you have your young trees coming up that aren't even necessarily 100% maple, just a, a good hardwood that's growing 
and, and not a, a vine or something that's going to take over and, and create issues 10 or 15 down, years down the road. Again, you want to put value to everything that you do from start to finish, especially value your time. When, uh, when you put your systems in, make sure that they are food grade, please. Uh, don't cut corners. You, you are putting food in someone's body and, and is processed and, and you want to make sure that it's not going to be a negative impact in the, in them or your, your or yourselves. And appreciate your help, even family. Make sure you thank them. A lot of times we take people for granted, and and it doesn't quite get out your appreciation. But uh, I think it goes a long way. Now. Before you even start this venture, you need to understand what you want to do with your end product. See if you want to make bulk syrup or if you want to have retail, if you want to sell it out of your house, if you want to pick up some stores and sell wholesale, you need to plan with that ahead of time. And then build that into your, your cost so that you can make sure that it's a viable situation. The bulk market in the last few years has been pretty much in the toilet. Uh, I think it's working its way back up now at this point, but with Canada having so many more options that are available for tapping, uh, I don't see the market getting crazy again like it like it did. And, and the $3 bulk syrup is probably not going to happen anytime soon, if if ever again. Um, so, so make sure that you can justify what you're doing based on what it is now. Don't treat it like like the grain market where you just assume that somebody's going to take your product at harvest time and and there's going to be a, a buyer because that's the reality of that is there's there's a lot of syrup out there and, and you need to work it at marketing your your product, even if it's in a bulk stainless steel barrel, you, you still need to have a, an end source. And plan, in case you have a bad year, plan conservatively. Don't, don't go for that gallon per tap. And, and even at that half gallon per tap, go a little bit less so that you know that this is a viable situation and, and uh, there's a little bit of reality there that if things are better and you do get a, what they call a normal year where you're getting a half gallon per tap, that that's extra, not expected. Again, the, a lot of the bulk buyers anymore, we do have limits on on how much is taken in, uh, even on the national market and, and large scale, they are starting to to turn away syrup. They're they're only taking so much in, and if you're going to make a bad product or an off flavor, the the days of making the last couple runs of junk or buddy syrup, those those days are over. Uh, the market is small for what is available for selling there. And we wanna watch watch what we make. And even, even during the season, there's a lot of guys that are making not good flavored syrup because of the lack of paying attention. They're, they're too much in a rush to make the syrup instead of making it good. You wanna make sure your filters, all the way from your sap filters, all the way down to your, your press filters are clean and new and sanitized. There's a, there's a lot of syrup that's being made that has uh, a mold flavor or an off flavor, and that's mostly due to the lack of cleanliness 
even in your tanks. Make sure that that's, that's all followed through start to finish. Keep in contact with a local dealer or your end source. Make sure you have communication with them. Make sure that, that they understand what you're doing and what you need to do so that they can carry the products you can use or want to use. Most of them know, have an idea of what they can get and what's available. Make sure that, that they know what you need because a lot of times we can't get things like we used to and the demand is higher. So it's harder for us to get things in, especially with COVID now. Uh, bottles, jugs, and all that sort of thing is, is short supply. Everyone's trying to stock the best they can, but the reality is, is we just can't get enough in. So, so don't wait till the last minute and make sure that you have communication and, and they understand your needs. You don't want to step on other people's toes. This is a tight knit community. It's a family uh, sort of environment. Um, everybody knows everybody else's business and where they sell. You don't want to be that guy that everybody talks about that that took took my store from me or or uh, stepped on others' toes because they wanted to get into the market instead of doing their homework and and creating their own situation or their own their own um, company that, that they that they sell to uh, you don't want to you don't want to be that guy so again this we get a lot of people say well how you know you, you taste the syrup and it's and it's okay it's it's not that great and and they come back with well it's good enough and that that's become the the little smirk that the that the buyers have now is that you know you you, you make a decent product you don't make a great product but it's good enough well is it good enough for you or just good enough to get rid of you want to make sure that you have something that's that's a great taste that you make good efforts for so on this chart, this as a little comparison is from 2013, you see the difference with customer service stories and the negative for the most part outweighs the positive. So generally you're gonna see something that's negative in a review generally eight times faster than you will find something that's a positive review. And you see the different situations here. Now fast track to the next page from 2013 to 2018. And you see how much of a bigger difference it is. And I attribute that a lot to the internet. The world, the word travels much faster than it used to almost instantly and you see the negative impact that is created compared to what it was years ago. And, it's, and especially with Google or uh, Amazon where everything is instant. People expect a lot more than they should at this point. And with you as a business owner or a supplier they expect the Amazon service from you, even though it's not realistic. So you have to do the best you can to make the most positive experience for those customers so that you're not in, in this same situation where, where the negative outweighs the, the positive and then, then you don't have a source to, of getting rid of uh, your product when you're done. So once your syrup cools, it will have a different flavor than when it was hot. It always tastes great right off the evaporator, probably the best it ever tastes. Uh, once it cools and sets is when you start getting the off flavors. 
you want to pay attention to that. If you see something, even if it's minor, take it to your neighboring operations. Don't be ashamed. Talk about it. Communicate with them and see where the problem lies so you're not continually doing this. See where your where problem comes from. Sometimes it's just metabolism. Sometimes it's just the trees. We'll get phone calls on the same day all across Ohio and in that in the whole region, even Pennsylvania and, and Indiana, where a certain day, all the trees, no matter what happens, nature just kicks out this bad tasting metabolism. There's nothing you can do. Uh, set that aside. Sometimes after six months, it actually straightens itself out. Sometimes it never goes away and you need to blend it in. You don't want to put that syrup that's off flavored 100% into a jug that somebody else is going to taste and, and be off put with that. You want to blend it with something better that if, if you have to, to um, just sell your crop. And sometimes you have to wait till the next day just just so you have a fresh palate and sleep on it overnight and, and um, sometimes your your flavors just they don't don't go away sometimes it stays on your tongue for quite a while and and uh, you need to get your even yourself give yourself a second opinion on, on what you have So that's all I have. I don't know if there's any questions or. Yeah, I wanna encourage everyone to um, type your questions in the Q&A section or in the chat. And at the, Cindy has a little bit more to say. And then at the end, we um, will go through those questions. Thank you very much, Fred. And now over to you. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, first of all, thank you, Fred. That was great. I always try and grab a tidbit every time um, I, we're in on one of these. And one of the things that I got from your presentation was something I hadn't thought about before. And that is that record keeping also relates back to your history and your electronic and social media efforts. And that it's a record that lasts longer than most. Um, be it good or bad, and that part of your record keeping system should also include how are you monitoring that for feedback? Um, how does it relate back to your branding, the image of your company or your product, and also how to manage those reviews? Do you, um, you know, do you reply back to them? Uh, do, do your, you know, are your customers referring to them? That kind of thing. So, Thank you for that. I'm going to add that to my to my library of things. Um, one of the comments that we had that came in during um, Fred's presentation was the comment that computers crash. And so you want to make sure that any kind of record keeping system that you're doing does um, if it if the computer crashes, if you choose to do electronically, um, it doesn't stop your operation. You can still move forward because you have either a backup or you have a way of, um, you know, manually um, taking over and, and capturing that data that you need uh, if you don't have the advantage of your computer. And Karen will tell you that uh, she's had an experience with that very recently. And, and so it's critical to have, have a place to have that information, um, even though it may take time to restore it, at least um, it won't be lost. Um, Fred also emphasized um, something I had made an opening comment about, which is that whole idea of networking. And one of the um, comments that he made and emphasized was that um, it's important to be able to cipher through information and know your source and know how it works for your company or your business. And, um, you know, there are some things that just may not make sense for you. And how do you cipher through that um, and in terms of not causing extra work and all that good kind of thing. Um, the next part of this presentation is not very long, but hopefully it's going to provide you all with some tools. And that is um, what are those data points and what are the things that you need to know about your operation so that you can do those decision making in addition to, um, you know, how you're going to plan and, and move forward and, and grow. So I'm going to use a, an example, a little bit of an example from a different world, but um, 
Brittany Hervey, who is not with us this evening because she's working on another project, but um, she helped us with our, uh, our regulation and, and uh, compliance manual that we did a, a, a program on last week. And part of it was is when, when Brittany first started coming to our sessions that talked about women in agriculture and, and, and uh, uh, enterprise planning, um, she didn't keep records. Um, she will now tell you she is a, a she is a, a, a slave to enterprise budgets. She loves them, um, and she th they use them all the time. And an enterprise budget is basically a snapshot of your operation. And we were uh, doing a workshop together at one point, and someone was talking about how they had grew heirloom tomatoes. They that was their niche. That was their business model. They loved it. Well, after they worked through an exercise of figuring out how much they were spending to grow and market and deliver and service their accounts for these heirloom tomatoes, they were spending approximately $1.89 a pound and they were selling them for $1.29. Um, and so when you look at that and you start to look at your inputs and all that, I will share with you that that person is no longer doing heirloom tomatoes. Um, so that's the power of these records and these data points that you're going to look at. So um, back to the first slide that Fred had, which was, do you know how much syrup a tap is producing? So in order to do that, in order to answer that question honestly and realistically, you're going to have to know some things. You're going to have to know how many taps you have in. You're going to have to know how much sap you're bringing in. You're going to have to know, you know, what your yield is, how much sap at this point um, is, is uh, yield, how much sap do you need in order to yield your gallon, um, you know, how much time in between the gathering and the and the processing is happening so though you know when you think about what records do i keep go to the very basics and that is what is your break even point or what is your price floor what do you absolutely have to have in the marketplace in order to pay all of those expenses that we just talked about and so you know that is basically the important question. So how do I get there? Um, so I've gone ahead and gone to kind of those experts in the field um, and of, of highlighting two tools. Um, there are more out there and I would encourage you if you have access to others or you're already in the middle of using others, um, put it in the Q&A, share it with your with your neighbors and, and share it with your network. Um, but this is the University of Vermont one. And what I really like about this, and I believe Karen and, and Kate are putting this link in the chat box for you all, is this is an online module. And my, my answer to, I don't have a computer and I, I'm not really interested in doing this electronically, go find a friend, go to your extension agent, call Mike Recklin or Kate, um, you know, somebody can help walk through this for you so computer doesn't have to be the challenge um and so the university of vermont and i don't know if mark's on board but i think this is out of your shop um so you know this is the opening page and it's real easy you 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 know you answer the questions next slide please after you fill out that first section then they're going to go ahead and they're going to walk you through a series of other questions and what I really like about this is it makes you think, because when we sit there and, you know, in the econ world, we talk about fixed costs and variable costs and all that good kind of thing. This tool will actually screen by screen say, how much money are you spending on the telephone? Well, Cindy, you know, I use my personal phone for the, t for, for my business phone to sell syrup. Well, you know, is there a way to account for that cost? Is there a percentage that you can fill in? So it gives you lots of different boxes to fill in so that you can accurately really kind of estimate. And I would encourage everyone to estimate the first time they go through this. What are my costs? And at the end, this is what you're going to get. You're going to get the year and you're going to get the number of taps you have, how much you produce, and those costs for if you purchase inputs, which in this point, this in this section, it accounts for if you purchase sap, if you purchase syrup, um, what other items do you purchase for resale? Those kinds of things. Next slide. 
then these are the variable expenses. And like I said, it, may, it really kind of makes you think, what am I really spending on it? on my on my um, enterprise and the good news is you can bring this to your accountant at the end of the year next slide it does the same thing now you may have zero in a lot of these columns especially if you're new or you're small at this point but you're looking to grow i'm going to tell you why this is a really valuable next slide at the end of the day this is the data that you're going to get. All of those numbers that you put in beforehand are going to yield this and look at what you've got. Because if you remember that opening slide, it asked you a couple of things. How many taps do you have? Are you using gallons or pounds as your unit of measure? What are your total expenditures? What do I need to have in order to go into the next year to even begin to produce or, or, or um, have the syrup that I want? The other thing question that it asks on that front page is whether you're using this as a budget for the future or if you're doing an analysis of data that you already have. So this is a great starting point for you when you start to think about what do I need to know in terms of data? What, do I, what am I going to go ahead and have to keep track of in that record keeping system? You know, it's not a bad thing to put it all in the big box bag that I had as long as at the end of the season or at some point, you actually take that information and then decipher it down and put it into a tool like this. Now, long before spreadsheets happened or you were able to plug it in on the computer, you know, there's the six column accounting pad and that, that is not the wrong way to do it either. There's the dome record keeping book. Either way, these are the kind of data points that you wanna look at and you can go ahead and do this from year to year. The other thing you can do is you can say, wow, if I want to go ahead and increase my taps, I can just go ahead and start over again in this spreadsheet, put in my expanded number of taps and then um, go ahead and, and it, it will basically allow you to say, if I want to go ahead and put in an extra thousand taps, these are the increases in expenses that I'm going to have in order to end up with these numbers at the end of the day, which is my break even point. So you want to make sure also that you're not selling below these last two numbers. Okay, because I said before, profit is not a four letter word. So you want to make sure you do that. The other thing that I really like about this is be honest, like Fred said, your time is valuable. You need to account for your time. Um, it is really easy in the agriculture sector and particularly in maple syrup. And I believe Fred used the word passion. Um, we, lo we love what we do and therefore you, you don't necessarily value your time and, and energy. And as you grow and expand, you're going to need to do that to be realistic. Next slide. So also I have a link here to the Coronel maple calculators. And what I really like about the uh, Coronel series is it also factors in those value added products. If you wanna go ahead and, and, you know, should I sell syrup by the gallon or should I go ahead and do maple cotton candy at fairs and festivals? What are the, what's the difference from, um, what is the difference in profitability with that? And also, understanding that these actually build in the fact that you're going to have additional costs because you're going to have processing time, you're going to have processing expenditures, you may have packaging costs that you didn't have before and all that good kind of thing. So this is also a really great spreadsheet. And again, the great thing about these is you can download them if you have access to Excel and you have some savvy with that, or you can download them for somebody else to do for you. Um, although I would encourage you to think about your friends and family. Um, you know, when we had the, the, the jam and jelly business, uh, I always thought that I was working for a not-for-profit organization. So <laughs> appreciate those friends and family. Um, but this is one way that they can um, contribute and become interested in, in, in this industry and, and, and provide some additional help for you down the road as you're starting to grow and expand. So this is the Maple, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the Cornell um, set of those. 
Um, the other thing that they included, uh, and that's fine. Yeah, so just there's a link there. And again, if you need help navigating any of these, you know, there are lots of folks out there use each other. Um, that's the great thing about this industry. You all are so willing to share with each other. Um, next slide. This is, um, uh, I think Tom Hammett is on the phone, and this is uh, Virginia Tech, or uh, uh, Dr. Cole actually works for them, and he does a series um, for the Farm Credit of the Virginias, and he's gone ahead, and for those that are looking for some future financing, you know, you may have to go to the bank, and they start, may start throwing away things about, um, well, I want to know your... Um, debt to asset ratio and those kinds of things. This is a quick uh, cheat sheet that he did. In addition to the fact that he also gave you a range in terms of what are my target numbers here? And they're pretty broad and you know not one size fits all, but there's some really interesting um, tools to be gained by there in terms of being able to take some of those numbers and really start to do some higher level decision-making uh, when you start talking about some significant financial investment. Next slide. Um, the other thing um, I wanted to go ahead and mention is uh, the fact that the ever-changing tax world, <laughs> um, it's been an interesting uh, year in the farm sector. Um, I, I attended a, a program about I think it was probably 14 days ago, and it talked about what is changing in the income tax world. Um, I think Kate or Karen has put up the link. Uh, the publication for farm uh, tax returns is lengthy as usual. It's ever changing. Uh, one of the things that I did get out of that particular workshop that I went to was um, they haven't really decided yet how to deal with those CFAP payments that you may have gotten. Um, so if those of you that may have gone ahead and applied to, to, your, to your local, I believe it was farm service agency, um, you know, and you got your payment based on the number of um, uh, gallons of, of sap and, and lost due to COVID and that kind of thing, they haven't decided whether that's going to be, um, yeah, Schedule F. Yes, Russ, that is correct. And that's, that's the guidebook for, for Schedule F that they put the link to. And uh, so what I would encourage you is to, um, instead of getting mired in that, because it can be confusing, next slide. My last piece of advice, you have to have a team. Um, when you get beyond the hobby level and you're willing to absorb the losses and you wanna start thinking about how do I at least break even or start to make money, you're going to want to be able to rely on a team of advisors. In addition to the networking of maple producers, you need to think about, you know, your accountant, go to them, talk to them, find out about the new rules for depreciation. Um, you know, you have options in the tax world in terms of how you decide to, to, to do things like depreciation. What's gonna work best for you? Um, is this gonna be a standalone or is this part of a, a larger farm operation and you need to consider um, the equipment and, and, and land debt that you may have um, for lots of enterprises in addition to Maple and Maple is just a part of it. Um, don't get to the point where it's too late before you start calling in those folks and, and let them be aware. Um, you know, the other thing that we talked about is, is if you go to your accountant, you can find out ways where you can go ahead and make sure that you are accounting for all of those costs, but also using those as an advantage when it comes to the end of the year and your bottom line. Um, your insurance agent is critical. And again, a lot of insurance agents, especially in the value added world, product liability insurance is generally related to your amount of production. And in order to justify the cost that you, 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 you are doing in terms of your break even point and paying for your insurance and your product liability, um, you're gonna have to work with your agent and find out what, what makes sense there. The other thing is, is all that wonderful expensive equipment that you worked really hard to justify and, and, and purchase and, and buy and get to a production level of where it warrants it, um, make sure your insurance agent knows about it, you know, invite them out, let them know what you're doing. Um, the other, you know, your attorney, 
the structure of your company? Um, you know, does it make sense to just do it as an individual? Or I'm at the point where, now where I need to go ahead and think about how my insurance agent and my accountant all relate and talk to one another and are on the same page. And maybe I need to form an LLC or some other um, uh, business entity that would help me with my risk management. So I'm going back to that slide where I showed all the different risk areas and how record keeping really relates to it. And that, that record keeping is what you're gonna to bring to these people because they're gonna help you with additional decisions. And then obviously the banker, that's an easy one. Um, but again, when you go to the banker and assume that debt load, make sure that you know the impact on each area of your operation and each of these team of advisors. Um, because everything is related and everything overlaps. Next slide. I think that that is all I have. Thanks, Cindy. Uh, we did have some questions in, so, um, but I wanted to remind you, you wanted to say something about CFAP payments perhaps? Yeah, I did, and I think I got it. Yeah, I wanted to make sure because yeah, I and, and maybe somebody on the line knows, but as of a couple of weeks ago, they hadn't decided whether you're going to have to claim those as income. Um, there was there was a lot of debate about it. And so um, I'm not prepared. I, I, I can't tell you what the decision was. And maybe there wasn't one. But again, that's a, even more rationale to make sure that you have your accounting and, and legal and all those ducks in a row if it's going to impact your um your return and your um, and your and your tax filing. Right. Thank you. Sorry. Um, and so for Fred, we have a few questions about your production record keeping. Can you give us some examples of um, things that you track track in your production record keeping, and then maybe some specific examples of what you might be recording daily? Sure. So. We want to record our gallons collected each day and and make sure we're not losing uh, out in the woods somewhere. You want to record the sugar content and then do the calculation. So once you boil, you're going to have some syrup in your evaporator, but make sure if you're using an RO or some other device in between, that you're not losing. It's been known that to put a valve in the wrong place and as you're concentrating, it has happened that the, the concentrate actually goes down the drain instead of into the tank and the, the permeate ends up in your feed tank to feed your evaporator and you end up with, with no syrup. So you wanna pay attention to that for sure uh, and, and compare notes from the beginning to the end of about how much you should have made so, so you know what your intake is and, and, and where you have to be, especially when you're buying sap from a neighbor or if you're working on shares, the last thing you want to do is have it go down a drain or, or lose the syrup in a, in a drum where the bung is not tightened and it empties out overnight. You still owe that, that person bringing sap and you still owe them the, the syrup and, and you want to, just double check what you have going on so that, so that you can uh, not have that loss as well. Thanks. Um, and then do you have, like what tools do you use? Do you write it down with a pencil and paper or do you have a preferred way of keeping those records? Do you have a clipboard? Do you always keep in the same spot? Yes, generally it's a, a clipboard with or a notebook. Uh, a liter evaporator used to make a, a really nice book. I don't think it, they do anymore. I'm not sure. Uh, I haven't seen it for a few years anyway. That was very specific to, to maple production and recorded every bit from start to finish to make sure that your numbers were accurate and, and, and there was a follow through. But you definitely want to keep it in the sugar house probably in your canning area where it's the driest. Um, as Cindy said, there's, you wanna have a, a book that records that, that is weather resistant and, uh, and doesn't fade or, or the ink or the, 
or the the lead uh, runs or disappears where where you lose all your data from year to year, and and obviously a, a loss of your production numbers. Great, thanks. Um, so, I'm, so, the, so the example I use for that is, is my dad's favorite thing to do was to uh, dump the pickle juice on the records. So that's why we went to putting everything in a plastic sleeve. A little <laughs> more work, but, but there was no pickle juice. So I can only imagine that syrup would cause the same effect. Um, yes. <laughs> um, we had a question about the record keeping for weather data. And I think if you go back to that slide, that app was there for that. Um, and I guess I was wondering, I, I'm sure that there is for maple producers because that's such an integral part of your business. So my question is, does someone have a good solution for that? I don't, I just, I, and we do record, uh, what the weather does for the day and and previous as as we tap and how long it sits before we actually make syrup so so as john asked is there record keeping for the weather that that goes back to part of this internet and and social media where everybody knows everybody's business these big guys start tapping after christmas and they always have they have crews going out there to tap each person taps say 600 to a thousand taps a day and they're going out there every day in, until February, but they have to in order to get done by the time the regular season comes in. So this year and last year, weather is a lot warmer than it used to be. And we are, are actually having runs in January. So these guys are are going on social media, letting everybody know that they've tapped. They have so many taps out. They're collecting 100,000 gallons in a day. Everybody's all wound up. So everybody wants to go out and tap their trees. The problem is, is if you're in Southern Ohio, the Southern tier and warmer areas of West Virginia, January is normal time to tap. You start getting above Route 70 and up around even above 90, you have clim climate change where it's several weeks back to start tapping. So you, you you start tapping too early, obviously your tap holes dry out even under vacuum. With tubing, you still have that dry out or you have those tree shutdowns premature instead of waiting till the proper time. Even though the weather has been warmer, the data is showing that if you stick to the normal times, we're Northern uh, Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, normal time is around uh, Valentine's Day, where Southern Ohio, they're gonna be a lot lot sooner, but, but if we tapped sooner, we could actually make less syrup than those guys that tap, even, even those with buckets have made more syrup by waiting till the first part of March. They've made more syrup than the guys on tubing under vacuum because the tap was put in too soon and and there was too much bacteria growth which actually stopped your hole from producing so so the critical time is, is you want to be wait you want to wait and you want to be patient and, and not get wound up it's very easy to get wound up everybody's always excited for the first day of making syrup but they're also very excited for the last day when it's all done and and you don't want to get yourself ahead and then have that loss of income after making this huge investment. Yeah. Um, uh, one, of the, on, one of the other points that I had brought up was about that, how to treat the CFAT payments on your income tax. And Keith um, pointed out that we do know that, that it has to be reported as gross income. The question was um, in the debate, I think, is for all of those payments is, are they gonna be able to f uh, provide a mechanism for you to back those payments out? Or are they considering those loans, therefore you have to claim those as income in order to balance it out? And that's the, that is the big question is, is that 
most people applied for and got CFAP payments with the understanding that it was a cost recovery payment from the government and not a, um, an income mechanism. It was to make up for lost income. So that was kind of the big debate. And, and like I said, as far as I know, it was still pending. So Keith, you are correct. It has to be put as gross income on the form, but the, you know, stay tuned for what, how else you're supposed to deal with it. Uh, and one more note, jumping back to weather, I just want to make everybody aware that if you are looking for weather data for your area, a good resource is wonderground.com, and I'll put the link in the chat, but um, they're cool because you can actually, uh, they have a format of weather for an entire month that's already happened, um, and you can get maximum temperature, average temperature, minimum temperature, um, that you can actually copy and paste from their website directly into a spreadsheet. So if you're looking for um, like a whole month's worth of high and lows, it's a good resource. I also wanted to say, sorry, we're in the same room, so our computers keep bouncing off each other. Um, I, I wanted to mention that I found in my own farming um, endeavors, uh, the time apps for your phone, timekeeping apps is really helpful because sometimes you get pulled away and you spend five or 10 minutes here or there doing something. And it's really nice. It's like a, some of these timesheet apps are like a clock in, clock out, and you can just label it like spent time in the sugar bush. You hit tap clock in and then you tap clock out when you're done and it keeps a record for you. And those are helpful to pull back and you can sort of see where your time is spent as well. Um, I think the one I used was called time tracker, but those are nice. And then um, I think Kate threw up the link to our um, regulatory manual that we made um, a few months ago and we put in some example logs in there and especially for batch record keeping inside the sugar shack and so those logs are helpful um yep there's your link uh i also wanted to mention um if you make a a list or you make a spreadsheet out of all the things that you want to track and you have them there and you have a place to write it down, you're going to be much more likely to actually track it in one place. And so these logs are nice and you can go through and pick and choose, you know, the things that you want to track and make it really work for your own operation. I did uh, note that Charles Hammer um, had another weather reporting app that he uses, uh, C-O-C-O-R-A-H-S.org. Um, it's in the chat. And thank you, Charles, for sharing the resource with us. And uh, Cindy, I have a question for you um, from a man named Charles. He said, I'm at the point where I need to consider some legal costs, such as forming an LLC to protect from liability in our litigious society. How can I accomplish this economically? So, yeah, that's a, that's a, the, obviously most secretary of states um, have a web presence that allow you to do that yourself. Um, and there's some advantages to doing that um, in terms of costs. But if you're starting up, you're going to need some things like uh, you're going to need uh, uh, annual meeting notices and all that good kind of thing. So um, I had not been in that LLC world. We actually, when uh, we transferred the company from Vermont down to West Virginia, we formed a B Corp because LLCs weren't really the thing to do. Um, but there are some definite advantages to LLC. So I, my recommendation is to look at um, legal counsel to make sure that based on your entire situation, both personally and your business enterprise, that you're going with the right thing. Um, in terms of that liability protection. And uh, there's, you can do some reading. Um, you can check with your local extension service. A lot of them in their business planning have some tools that allow you to evaluate that. Um, and then 
again, there's a, some real value to going to a lawyer and getting it set up. Um, but if you feel comfortable and you know what you want to do and how you're going to do it and you understand the ramifications of your decision, then you can certainly go ahead and do it online. Um, so I, we, as I said previous, I had not had any experience with LLCs. Um, I'm in a different situation now in the particular state that I'm in. Um, we were able to file for an LLC for one of our companies this year and I did it online and I used some templated minutes and all that good kind of thing but I always but I ran it through our attorney just to make sure and that way um, we didn't have the the $350 cost that we would have had for him to do it but at the same time I felt like he knew what we were doing and why we were doing it and I was able to go online and file it myself for a hundred so uh, it's going to be a state to state and a situation to situation um, I would just in my opinion, the first time I would I would use an attorney, and then from there you can look at you know whether or not that's something you feel like you can do yourself comfortably. Hope that answered your question. Oh, and use your extension service. Yeah, they've got uh, like Ohio. Ohio has that cooperative program. They have a whole unit of extension folks that 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 have all that and they can talk to you about the different business structures and what makes sense for you everything from cooperative to sole proprietorship uh we had a question come up that said can all these links be emailed to all the attendees and the answer is yes um just for reference, all of you are going to get a follow-up email and it will have a link to the recording of this webinar. So if you wanna go back and rewatch it or watch any part of it or share it with people, you'll have that link. And then it will also have all of the links that you saw in the presentation um, in that email as well. And you can expect that around seven o'clock tomorrow night. I know we have some folks on the line like Les Ober and maybe Tom Hammett and Mike Recklin. Um, I would invite them. Is, is there anything we missed that we should have shared? Mm -hmm. Uh, folks, if you would like to say something or um, if we did miss something, just use the raise your hand button and we can give you um, the ability to speak. And um, in this moment, I'm actually going to launch a poll as people are coming up with their last questions. Um, just let us know what you thought of the webinar. Thank you very much. And stay tuned for next month's webinar, um, which is going to be on centered around agritourism and how to um, make sure your farm and your business is ready for guests uh, with some special COVID precautionary um, measures, but also in general. And that will be with our lovely Cindy Martell again and Donna Brooke Alt. So stay tuned for that. You can go to future.edu slash maple to watch all of our past webinars um, or to register for any upcoming ones if you happen to be watching this on YouTube right now. Are registered, you registered for this event and you're on the Zoom um feature you will be automatically registered for the next webinar so um just check your email inbox for the link and the reminders for that thank you everyone Thank you, Cindy and Fred. It was a great presentation tonight. Thank you, Fred. It was so good meeting you. And, and, and I, I hope I can get back east again and visit your operation. Yes, thank you. It's been good. All right. You guys have a nice evening. You too. You as well.